Good morning. It's good to be here, isn't it? It's good to see you. Welcome to Angela and Faith, especially. Angela is going to preach up a storm for us today. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Join with me. Let's sing, hey?
Good morning, everyone. Um, I welcome everyone and any visitors to the church and our online viewers. Special welcome to Angelo and Faith. <coughs> Sorry. Bringing our ser- and I'm looking forward to Angelo's sermon for today. There's no birthdays or wedding anniversaries this week. Monday, we have um, Boys Brigade starting again after the holidays at 6.15 p.m. Tuesday, we have the Connect Group at 9.30 a.m. And we have Diagnet Business Meeting at 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. Wednesday, we have KYB at 9.30 a.m. And on Thursday, we have ASD Support Group at 9.30 a.m. And next Sunday, a morning worship at 9 a.m. Upcoming dates, we have Tuesday the 25th of April is Anzac Day, our public holiday. Wednesday the 26th of April is Shed Happens. On Saturday the 29th of April we have the Country Gospel Concert at 7pm with Dean Perrett. Um, And I'm sure there's there's a pamphlet out about that. Uh, May Mission Month is fast approaching. Please read the details in the bulletin. And if I've missed anything, remember to read our bulletin as it has more details in there. Thank you, everyone. Um, just one more thing. I just want to say thank you um, to my to the church family for all your prayers for Marcus. I really, on um, behalf of David and I and Marcus, thank you. because um, And just keep praying for healing upon his eyes. Thank you. Hey, how good is it to welcome Marcus back among us? Where are you, Modi? Hey, it's... Great to have you back, and we will certainly continue to pray and, uh, and seek the Lord. Um, Tony's home this morning looking after Jen. She's crook. Um, Jackie's in bed crook and uh, found out this week that her sister's entered, not Trish, but Lorraine, the next one up, has entered end-of-life treatment, so Jackie wants to get well. So, yeah, big time for the family. Um, Colin Leanne, Cole had COVID early in the week and he's kind of on the upside of that. Leanne has now come down with COVID, so we certainly need to pray for her. And Tony told me uh, a lady that was once here, Sue Goswich, has received some tough news this week um, with six, about six months uh, around a brain tumour, so some some sort of a thing. So, so apart from that, we've also got other stuff we need to pray into as well. So how about we, we engage a time of pastoral prayer? But before we do that, I'm actually going to ask Angela and Faith to come up because we'll include some prayer into Hellenic ministry and their work um, and as, as a part of our extension of our mission. So um, I might give this one to you, Faith. Okie dokie. So, mate, you know, I, I would understand um, you, you, have, you have a wonderful Greek heritage and, you know, there's, there's kind of um, a story in there that I, I, I say ophthalmos and you'll say it differently, but we're both talking about the eyes, aren't we? Apparently. Apparently. Mate, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with Hellenic Ministry? Good morning, everybody. Good to be here again. Um, yeah, a few years back, Faith and I went uh, on long service leave in uh, Greece. Long story short, we were touched by the Lord about the lack of resourcing for the church there uh, and got involved with a group called Hellenic Ministries, who have a monster <coughs> uh, ministry in, in Greece. Uh, they have a staff of about 60, uh, most of whom are Greek. And uh, they, they just have a huge variety of, uh, of ministries there. Uh, and uh, seeking to reach Greece uh, for Christ. Would you like yeah. to add something to that? So, 
I was going to, my next question was, hey, I know this is a team thing. This isn't just about Jello. Faith, you've got a huge role in this as well. Could you tell us a little bit about where you kind of, how, how that works out for you? Well, I get to do one of my favourite things, which is organise travel. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we've kind of made a commitment to go over once a year. We've got involved with the church planting team of Hellenic Ministries. So how long do you go for when um, you go, Faith? Do you... We go for about two months, but we only spend about a month with Hellenic Ministries right. because Angelo also has a brother in Cyprus that we try to spend time with uh -huh. and a niece in Athens. Okay. And neither of them or their families are Christian. So now... When I think about the Christian church in Greece, I think, you know, Greek Orthodox. This is not that, is it? No. Okay, so can you help me understand okay. that the heart of the people that you're working among yeah. and, and how yeah. they're engaging their communities? Yeah. So 95% of the population of Greece would say they are Greek Orthodox Christians. Uh, they believe in God. But most of them don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Okay. So the heart of Hellenic Ministries is to uh, give the good news of Jesus so that the people of Greece become passionate followers of Jesus. And so Jello mentioned a moment ago, no, 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 you stick with it, Faith, you're doing real good. He, he gets his turn later. Um, so, so talking about church planting, I mean, that's yeah. kind of, um, yeah. yeah, how does that work? <laughs> Um, historically, pretty badly, um, in that the Greek Orthodox are very, were very opposed to any evangelical outsiders. Mm. They regard um, or have historically regarded us as a cult or as heretics. Yeah. Well, hairy um, tick, sure. I mean, look at the beard. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, but... But there's a little bit of a mellowing of that. So in the 70s and 80s, if you um, preached in the street or proselytised, tried to convince someone to change from Greek orthodoxy to evangelicalism, you could be beat up, arrested, put in jail. Wow. Um, it was against the law. It still is against the law to proselytise under 18s. Wow. But there are... Um, people within the Greek Orthodox Church, including priests, who can see that we're on the same page. Okay. So one of the goals of Hellenic Ministries is to find those people and to work with them. So one of their ministries is um, Bible distribution. Yeah. They've given out nearly 1.5 million New Testaments wow. across Greece. Wow. And one of the things they've tried to do is get the approval of the local... Um, Greek patriarchal bishop and he, in many instances he's been willing to write a letter and put it in the front of the New Testament that says this is the same Bible that we read it's okay for you to read it wow. and that's a huge thing. So it's really about I mean we're, we're kind of moving towards uh, Alpha in, in May and as a church we're praying particularly that God would reveal the person of peace that we can journey with and open doors and networks. It, it sounds a little bit yeah. similar. Yeah. They do talk a lot, even with their ministry of what they call church planting, which is really establishing um, discipling communities or communities of faith. They're not really looking to build buildings. They're just yeah. trying to um, find, they say, the person of peace within a village or a, or a small town and... Um, begin a Bible study around that person and see where God takes it. Wow, that sounds nice and dynamic and spirit-led and kind of... Uh, Scary. Very Jesus-like, actually. <laughs> so yeah. When's your next trip? Uh, we're going on the 29th of August. Okay, so you've got a little bit of time between now and then you'll be away for a couple of months. Yeah, and can I just say how wonderful it is that um, Angelo has kept his Greek language yeah um, because some of his cousins in Australia don't speak Greek anymore and he's really valued and appreciated by the church planting team over there um, yeah. he does a once a month zoom with them yeah. um, and he's like a mentor he's like the the old man that you know the white hair and yeah. and they they love him and they love his experience and his wisdom and they especially love that he speaks their heart language yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. This this <laughs> last time we were over, we were at a church planters with the church planters, and that. And I'm, I'm, there's all these, you know, mature 
guys or whatever, and they're listening, you know, we'd sit down and have a discussion, they're listening, and I'm going, this is a bit odd, you know, like, I'm, they're actually listening, whatever, and then I realised, it's the grey hair. It's the grey <laughs> hair, brother. Hey, you know, the, the only Greek that I've really hung on to is NRK, hot logos, kai, hot logos, theos, and because the hot goes go. in front of the logos, which is the reason, the word, the definite article, it is that word, the God, not a God. He is really the one. How did I go? Was that all right? The explanation was good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> execution, yeah. <laughs> hey, listen. I, I had to put up with this all through Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say it properly? You, no, it's all right. Please, please. Okay. <laughs> what was it with the. Oh, Logos in the Theos. Okay, that's. that's the word yeah. was got. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's... Yeah, okay. <laughs> You could tell the difference, can't you? NRK hot logos, Kai hot logos, theos, yeah. Okay, that's how I do it, but he does it different. And, hey, God, God understands. He, he really does. Um, he, God has given me the gift of tongues, and it's predominantly English, and I'm really grateful for it, you know. Um, but what I would like to do, Tim, could I invite you to come up with us? Um, as, you know, I, I'd, I'd have Tony and Celia. Celia's with Richard at home as well. Um, Mate, could I, could I invite you to, to commend um, Angelo and Faith to the Lord, particularly in the line of the Hellenic ministries, and then after that we'll come back to some pastoral prayer afterwards, yeah. Well, it's good to have friends amongst us, yeah. and certainly Angelo and Faith are very much loved by our church family here. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement they bring to us in the understanding of your kingdom building in another place. And thank you, Lord, for progress that's being made there with all the challenges that there are, but particularly the understanding and being able to work with the Greek Orthodox Church in opening up pathways. Yes, Lord. And, Lord, we do commend both Angelo and Faith, to you as they continue in this ministry. Mm. Lord, thank you for the wisdom and the experience that they have. Mm. Thank you, Lord, that that's very much valued there. And thank you for the uh, mentoring influence that Angelo's able to have throughout the year uh, through Zoom. Mm. Lord, as they prepare to go back there in August, we... We pray even now that you're opening up the connections, Lord, that you're um, providing those opportunities that they will be able to walk into once they get there. Mm. We thank you for them. We pray for your provision in every way. We pray for their safety in, in their travel and for good health. And Lord, also for that very special time of connecting with family while they're away as well. So we commit these things to you as we commit them to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. And as we come to a time of pastoral prayer, just a, um, a memory jog, 4.30 this evening for an hour that we'll gather here um, specifically to pray into our um, up-and-coming uh, Alpha series for those that are able, for those that aren't. Um, if you could remember us from where you are, that would be excellent as well. And um, the nine o'clock Thursday meeting, nine o'clock Thursday to um, to eleven, thrive and flourish. The prayer notes uh, come out with the the newsletter each week, and there's uh, a hard copy inside the bulletin for those that uh, would like that as well. But um, so let's let's spend a bit of time just tarrying with the Lord in prayer and Father thank you that you do call us as a holy nation a nation a, a, a people set apart for you for your purposes that that you've shown your grace to us to our church family that in Christ we now are new creations and, and Lord, uh, with the purpose that we would be and act as you would have us to be and become. And so we do want to pray for 
for ourselves in one regard, Lord, that we, you, we would be prepared for this season of Alpha. And, and Lord, for our community, that you would go before and open up doorways of relationships a little bit like Jello and Faith were talking about the person of peace, that, Father, that person of peace you would reveal to us, that would, we would be able to connect with and, and build relationship with and, and engage networks that maybe we may not be able to engage otherwise. But this morning, too, we want to present to you Scott and Rebecca's mum, Elizabeth, and pray for your comfort and peace for her as she adjusts to, to the news that she's received this week, that, that, Lord, you would bring your comfort, your peace, and your grace. Hold her hand and her heart as she walks this next part of her journey. We pray for Scott and Rebecca and family as well, for your comfort and peace. Lord, we commit to you, Jen and Tony, as he cares for her this morning in her circumstance. And we would ask you, Lord, to be the glory and the lifter of her head, sustain her. We want to present to you, Kyle and Leanne Inkelmeyer as well. Ask you for your sustaining grace to heal and restore them. Through this COVID, get them back on their feet, we pray. We do want to pray for... For my Jackie as well in, in her flu and her unwellness and compounded by the news about Lorraine, we do pray for Lorraine's transition from this world to your presence, that it be gentle. We pray for the rest of the family that each would know your peace and your grace. We do want to commend to you Sue Goswich as well and, and her family as she adjusts to her news. There's a lot going on for so many people, Father. We pray for your comfort and your peace for Sue and for those that know and love her. Father, we want to embrace all of our missionaries uh, with gratitude and thanks for each one, for each family, for each person and the works that they are accompanied uh, and ac accomplishing in the wonderful name of Jesus through the the expression and, and enabling of the Holy Spirit. Father, we're grateful for our privilege to partner in so many different parts of the world with these missionaries, to partner in their work, to, to pray, to financially support, to enable them to, stay, to, to keep their shoulder to the grindstone and, and, and keep reaching people in Jesus' name. And Father, we do commend... The, the, the prayer life of our church to you. Grateful for the work that is happening by your spirit through our Sunday afternoons as we're meeting to pray for Alpha and through our Thursday mornings as we sit and centre and soak, saturate, focus on Jesus and move into intercession. Thank you for these, these ministries that are emerging among us in this time and season. Father, we, we commend all of those among us not well, because there are many more than I've mentioned this morning. Father, we pray for your goodness and your grace to be manifest among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, you may or may not be aware that there's been a very big cross planted, basically, in the centre of our nation. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, I thought I'd just share a little bit about it because it's actually pretty exciting. So this is in Central Australia in uh, Aikunji, which is an Indigenous community. And they, that community had a vision to do that, build that and raise it up on the top of a mountain. That is Memory Mountain. And it's 20 metres tall, that cross. And so I can actually remember when I was in high school, so over a decade ago, um, hearing talk of a big cross gonna, that's going to be erected in the middle of the country. And that's all I sort of heard. And it was just really cool to, to hear that that's actually happened. It actually it wasn't just gossip or some random, I don't know, whatever. It actually happened. How cool is that? And so... Um, on Good Friday, it was launched, 
which was exactly 100 years since four young Indigenous evangelists actually preached the gospel at that mountain. So if we go to the next photo, that's it, lit up at the launch. Uh, they had a massive concert and celebration. And there's more, there's more to, like, behind the story of the why and everything like that. So feel free to look into it yourself. But, um, yeah, the community is pumping. And I think there's one more photo as well. Yeah. How beautiful is that? That's basically in the heart of our country. How, how fantastic. So I do have... I just wanted to share this. So... Um, to, um, yeah, some words that have been shared um, around it. This is from a local elder. And he said that we want people to know that our nation and our place is covered by Jesus. And a local leader said, God is our future. And we're saying, God, forgive us all for trying to do things in our own strength. And I believe we're going to see great things in this community. Praise God. Hey, let's pray. Jesus, we say yes and amen to the declaration and the heart cry that you would reign in the hearts of every person in this nation. We give you the glory and the praise for the vision that you've given your people, and we're grateful that you're moving in our country. Amen. You want to join with me? Let's give him the glory.
Proverbs 3, 5 to 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. That is always relevant. Let's keep worshipping, hey? Breath we've done. 
Good to be here. And uh, oh, that's a terrible photo. Oh, golly, who put that resolution up there? Now, I want you to know just as we start this morning, it's great to be back, but I want you to know that I'm not the person I used to be. All right, and I just want you to know a little bit of you know who you're dealing with here this morning. A couple of Two days ago, I think it was. Anyway, I was in the office and Faith says to me, I hear her saying, where's the kettle? And I said, what do you mean? She says, where's the kettle? The electric kettle, you know, that we make our coffee with. I said, it's in the kitchen. She says, no, it's not. I said, yes, it is. What are you talking about? You know, so how do I go? And it's not there. So, where's the kettle? And so we started looking. It wasn't in the kitchen. It wasn't in the living room wasn't in the dining room. Where's the kettle? It's in the cupboard. No, it wasn't in the cupboard. In the fridge. Not, not in the fridge. You know, not anywhere really. Till finally, it was in the microwave. <laughs> I won't tell you who put it there. <laughs> so, well, I can't remember to be honest, so obviously I, yeah, no. So anyway... That's, that's who you're dealing with here this morning. But the encouraging thing about that is this. If God can use somebody that puts the kettle in the microwave and can't remember doing it, he can use you. <laughs> okay? So, so if you don't take anything else from this morning, <laughs> be encouraged. All right? Be encouraged. I want to bring you some greetings this morning from the Maribor Baptist Church in the inner city of Melbourne, in the Maribyrnong Baptist Church in Athens, Greece, and the Maribyrnong Baptist Church in Stupa, in Greece, and in Ioannina, and in Hania in Crete. Have I gone crazy? <laughs> Is there something you don't know about? Has there been some church plants go out from here? No, but one of the things that, uh, having travelled around, and this last time that we were in Greece, we were up in Yonina, which is up in the northwest, and it just struck me as we were working with the church there, this, this is Maribara Baptist, you know? This is Gimpy Baptist. This is Gimpy Church of Christ. This is a whole lot of tens of hundreds of thousands of collections of the body of Christ like you here. And you know what? Who, who of you here know of those churches? No. Guess what? They don't know about you either. They don't know about you either. And in between here and there, there are tens of thousands of fellowships just like this. In England, places full of little fellowships. Nobody knows about them, you know, except maybe they're, you know, they're locally famous, maybe. <laughs> but nobody else knows about them except for Jesus. And Jesus knows about them. Every single one of them. 
And Jesus knows about you here. And he knows about every person here. Okay? And so it's something that is really, it just struck me, uh, you know, in, in that area there. And one of the things that we have had the privilege of in crossing some of these boundaries and, and looking at different places is being able to see what is kind of happening in different places. So just some of those places there, that's, uh, that's in Athens. So there you go. That could be nearly Maryborough Baptist, except it's in a big, it's an industrial shed. Okay. The Roman church is the gypsy church. So different to the, like, they really are different, you know, uh, the, the Roma people. That's underneath the house. That'd be about maybe a quarter of this area here, you know, that they, they minister. Um, okay, what have I done? You know what? Clickers are the same the world over. Rotten things. There you go. Same the world over. These. Okay. Uh, Stupa down the south there. We met with some folk there. That's the two people on the right there. Okay. And that place there is in Greece, but it's full of palms. Oh, sorry, British people. <laughs> I mean, chock a block full. We went on a walking group with these guys that had 40 something people in the walking group, and they were all English. And we met another group, the same size, who are all English. Okay, so a lot of people retire in their place. They're trying to reach out to those people there. Oh, you, you can click it for me, somebody, if you can do that. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, yeah, Nina, up the northwest, little place that's just a, a, a shop front, uh, working with refugees there, trying to reach out to the Greeks there. Okay, um, Hania in Crete, that's Elias and Nelly. They're very strange. They're not like you at all, are they? Yeah, really. Actually, well, they're probably a little bit, uh, they speak Greek a bit better than Reese, but that's about it. Okay, uh, they have a little corner, uh, a small shop. They do mercy ministries. That's their church. Okay, so they meet Sunday mornings out under the trees when they can, when the weather permits. Okay, so those are, uh, some of the churches that uh, we deal with, and they're very similar to our situation here. But there's some things that are interesting when I look at both. The church over there, uh, the evangelical church is kind of constrained. They're trying to grow. And one of the things that they're looking at is, you know, how do we plant new churches? And what they have in mind, some of them is, you know, things like this, bigger you know, getting, growing our churches in that. And the interesting thing that I find for myself is when I look at the church here and where we are here and realize that for a lot of our churches, I, I, I don't want to discourage you this morning, all right? I don't want to discourage you. Hang in till the end with me, all right? But for a lot of our churches, it's getting harder and harder and harder to maintain the model that we've grown up with, all right? So if you're a church of lower than about 50 members, it's getting harder and harder to financially, you know, maintain that model of we have the pastor and we have, you know, the, the thing there. And I have grown up in my life, my whole life in church work has been kind of, I've been pointed towards success is more people on these seats on a Sunday morning. Okay, that's the, the, the goal there. And so one of the things is that in Australia, that's kind of pretty well gone by the wayside. You know, if you drop below a certain number of people, it'll be very, very hard for you to get back up and keep that model going. Now, there's, that's a bit distressing, <laughs> if you like. However, it's also an opportunity. And it's the opportunity to connect back to what the main goal is. And the main goal is not bigger Sunday morning gatherings. Okay? Now, it's interesting because looking at the church in Greece, who are kind of heading here, I feel sometimes like the person that goes, you know, you have, you have grown up with, this is the goal. We've got to go to this place and we've got to cross that bridge. We're heading for that bridge. And I'm saying, that bridge isn't there anymore. And so there are things that we can learn that, you know, that can guide us in, in, in this process here as we work through uh, some of these things. 
Um, our context here, okay, you would have noticed, some of you at least would have noticed that it's getting harder and harder in some ways for the church. Anybody notice that? Okay, it's getting harder and harder for the church in that. And uh, that can be a little bit depressing. In the Western world, you know, there's been a change. Now, a lot of pastors and churches and, and a lot of us kind of emotionally, we sort of are thinking, oh, I'm looking back <laughs> and I'm hoping that that's, we're going to get back to that. Okay? My conclusion is I doubt very much that we're going to get back to that. Okay? I doubt that we're going to get back to that. And it's going to get harder. What's happened in the Western church, a guy called Tim Keller made this comment here, and he made it about America, okay? But it fits for, I think it fits for us as well here. And he says this, he said, the United States is slowly running out of traditionally minded Americans to be converted. The evangelical church is running out of like-minded people to convert, Okay, and we have been, we have grown up, most of you here, this, uh, well, okay, some of you here, okay, some of you here are nearly as old as I am. So you would have grown up in a time when our society generally thought in Christian ways and Christian values. Now, I've got some surprising news for you. It's no longer the case. I know you've missed that, <laughs> but it's no longer the case. Now, here's the other issue which Keller brings up, which I think is valid and helpful. And conservative Protestants on the whole are unwilling or unable to reach a highly secular and culturally different community. Here's our question. What is it that you and I have to say to people who are not like us? Okay, who are really of a different culture to us. People who can't speak Greek properly. <laughs> okay, what do we do with them? You know, uh, can Christ do something for us in, in, in all of that? Now, it can be discouraging because, you know, the thing I keep saying, which is encouraging, is that we're going into the world of the early church. Okay, and when I look around the place uh, and I look around Australia, what I see is, you know, we're being told all the time, you know, you're irrelevant, you, you, you know, you've, you've really got nothing to say. We feel that, you know, we feel that, that in ourselves uh, sometimes in that. But the truth is this, as I wander around the place, and those of you that have wandered around the place, I see that there are places where, listen, let me, let me just be blunt here, right? There are churches in Greece and some other places, but I'll talk about Greece because it's not here, okay? <laughs> but there are churches in Greece when I walk in and I kind of look at the way it's set up and the way it's operating and the way they do things, right? I just go, no way in a pink fit would I do something like this. <laughs> would I set it up like this? But Jesus is working in the midst of that. Jesus is still working all around the place. It is amazing. In the midst of places where to be, you know, please excuse me, I'd say this is a pig's breakfast here. You know, like it's, it's such a mess, you know. And still in the middle of that, you go, hmm, the Lord's still working. So it's encouraging. He's still working. He's still wanting to work. He still works in us. He still is working in me. And he still wants to work through us. So the Lord wants to work through all of the Meribah Baptist churches <laughs> around the place. Okay? And he can do it and he will do it. And in, in, in real world ways, you know, we sort of say, oh, well, the world is against us. You know? And yes, there are people who, when we look at them, even here in Meribah, right? There are lots of people in the world who don't give a peanut about us. You know, really, it, it's, not, it's not that they're against us. They, they just don't care. You know, they don't care about what we talk about as a church. They don't care about, you know, the things, our, our doctrines, our theology. Uh, they especially don't care about our dogfights and our arguments internally. Uh, 
oh, we don't have dog fights here. That's in other places. Uh, we, we have bun fights. No, we... Muffin, no. Scone fights, that's it. Flow scone fights, that's what it is, okay? But there are people out there that really don't care, you know? And, and we can easily feel, you know, what are we here for? But, but, there are still people who are searching. And there are still people who, if he was presented to them in the right way, are very interested in Jesus. Let me tell you about our friend Phil. Our friend Phil, friends Phil and Di, they're down uh, at a place called uh, Wingham. And near Tari? Okay. Wing, who knows of Wingham? Metropolis, isn't it? An amazing place. Okay, Wingham is, I think, one of the thespian centres of Australia. Um, over the last 10 weeks in Wingham, uh, there's been a community group, not a church group, community group, that has put on the play Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, Jesus Christ Superstar, when I was young, was like, great music, shock and theology. <laughs> you know? Okay? But it speaks. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is what Phil tells me. It started in the rehearsals, and then it just kept going through all of the performances. Right, it got worse at the last night. You know what was happening? Every time they came to the end of the play, where they took Jesus' body down off the cross and took him away to bury him, that he said it was, it was just emotionally draining on the, 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 the people that were in the play. And he said and it, got, it got more and more so as it went on. And he said there'd be tears, there'd be people that would have to recover, the actors would have to recover from the emotional experience because they were entering into, they were entering into what had been done to Jesus and why it had been done. Can you see what's happening here? So over repeated, repeatedly being able to enter into that and experience that somehow was affecting these people who, and they're not believers. You know, Phil was saying, you, you'd go there and you could hear this crying in the, in the audience. You have people being affected. And he said the thing was, because he's been part of this group for a long time, he said normally after a play is finished, you know, we'd have drinks and, a, you know, and, and the party after each performance. It, no way. He said, they just couldn't do it. They have to have a recovery time, you know, from it. See what I'm saying here? What, what, what I see there is here's all these people who got no idea about Jesus, don't go to church, right? They, they may know some Christians, but when they're able to be somehow engaged with Jesus, something can happen. Something can happen. And, and what an opportunity there for him to have discussions and things like that and, and people to be touched by that. Okay, great. <laughs> That's this experience here of people being engaging with Jesus. And that's us here. How do we bridge that? <laughs> how, do, how do we do that? You know, how, how are we able to do that? There's a clue for us in Scripture. Okay, the early church, I'll just get, I'll just, we, we, I've, we've talked about it, you, probably if you've heard me preach before, I keep saying, the, the place we're going into now, the place that we in Australia are going into as the church, and that your kids are going to go into and your grandkids are going to go into, right, is pretty close to what the early church was experiencing. And the early church was very, very effective in a very unfavorable situation, okay? And so that gives me hope. If God did that then, he can do it again. It's the same God. It's the same God, so it's quite possible for him to, to do it again. But how? Okay, here's our clue. 1 Peter 3.15, it says this. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. What's that mean? It means that in my inner being, in myself, when push comes to shove, when it's all about what's my main game, I say to Jesus, I'll do it your way. You have your way in me. 
and I'll do it your way in my life. Setting Christ apart as Lord in our lives. That's what was being told by Peter to the church there, okay, uh, in there. And what's the result of that? One of the results of that is you'd be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have in you. And you go, well, hang on. <laughs> How does that happen? Why does that happen? If I set Christ apart as Lord in my heart, all of a sudden people are going to start asking me questions. Something happens in between, okay? This is what happens, okay? We make Christ Lord in our heart, we're going to end up answering questions. Why? Because to make Christ Lord in our heart and to make him Lord of our lives means this. He'll be Lord over my personal life. He'll be Lord over my family life. He'll be Lord over my social life. And he'll be Lord over my church life and my church relationships. You you see what's happening here? If we set Christ as the boss of our life, he will change you and me. He will change you and me. Um, uh, 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 Green, what's his name? The singer that died a long time ago? Keith Green, right? Keith Green. Saw a little interview clip with Keith Green the other day, and he was being interviewed by someone on, on TV. And they said to him, um, what, why do you believe in God? And uh, he said, he changed me. And, and they said, yeah, but, but you know, <laughs> but why do, you believe, you know, why do you believe in God? And he said, he changed me. You, you see what he's saying? He didn't say, I was changed, or, you know, that I, I changed. No, he said, he changed me. When God works in your life and my life, when we set him apart as Lord in our hearts, he will change us. He will change us into the Jesus version of us. Okay? And then people will notice that because that will take effect in our personal life. It'll take effect in our family life, our social, in our church life. You know, as Jesus changes me, the thing I've noticed is there are times, I'll give you one quick example, right, of a change in me in that. Driving along, none of you have ever done this, I know this, right? You're driving along and somebody pulls in in front of you, yeah? And you're alone in the car, okay? You moron! I didn't say it. I just thought it. Jesus says to me, you can't say that, Jello. I'm going, what? What do you mean I can't say that? The guy, don't worry about him, you can't say that. But, but there's nobody else in the car, you know? What, what, what is it? I'm in the car. Yeah, okay. So I've got to make a deal then. I've got to work it out. What am I going to do? Am I going to go with that? Or am I just going to ah, forget it? I'm just going to keep doing it. So he changes me. And slowly he'll change you and me into the Jesus version of us. And as that happens, people will be affected in our worlds, in our families, in our churches, in our, and people will look at us. And they'll say, I'll have what they're having. Not everyone, of course not, but a lot more than maybe you and I are experiencing uh, in that. And so we share with people what Jesus has done for us. That's what it means to be a witness. You know, it's, it's not about telling people theology. It's not about people telling people a life philosophy. It's not about, you know, any of that. It's about telling, being a witness to what Jesus has done in us. Here's my question. Have I got enough that I've let Jesus do in me to have something to say, to have something to offer. Now, in my life, um, I would have to say that, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot I don't have to offer, but there is some that I do, actually, because he has actually done that. He has actually done that, and I can say with confidence to people, he can do that in your life as well. Now, what's that all mean for, for Maribor Baptist? I hear on the grapevine. Now, I haven't ascertained this myself, but apparently, apparently there's a whole swag of new people coming into Maribor, you know, over the next while, okay? 
And somebody has chucked a figure of around 10,000 roughly people coming into Maryborough in the next little while. That's exciting, isn't it? Imagine if there was a new town with 10,000 people coming in and we'd be going, all right, can we start a work there? Can we, you know, what, what, what can we do? Here's an opportunity because when people move, uh, okay, you and I know when people move, they're open to change. That's the time they're most open to change is, is when they first arrived somewhere. They're, it's a new place. They're making new relationships, new connections, okay? After a few years, it might be a little bit harder, but in that move. So here we go. They're going to plant a town of 10,000 people. Fantastic. Isn't that great? Great opportunity for us to go and to share the gospel uh, with those people. Very, very exciting. Um, now, I want you to notice something. What I'm saying here, it's a great opportunity for you and me to go and share the good news with them. Don't fall into the trap of going, oh, great, 10,000 new people, or whatever it is, coming into town. This is a great opportunity to get them to come in here and build our numbers up, okay? The community is not fodder for us to build the church up. The church is here to be a blessing into the community, okay? And you can be. Every single person here can be. Trust me, I'm not kidding. If God can use me, he can use you, okay? He can use you. How can it possibly happen? Well, I was very excited at our Queensland Baptist Conference that we were at last week. Uh, I wasn't excited because it was at the Gold Coast because the Gold Coast is sort of not really my favourite cup of tea, but that's all right beside that. But I was excited because of a couple of things that were being talked about there. And one of them was uh, from the guys from the uh, Crossways Baptist Church who were sharing about this thing called the Bible Discovery Process. And uh, some of you, who's heard of that? Yeah, a few people might have heard of that. Okay. Uh, Harvey Bay uh, has actually implemented that. And uh, I was talking to Ray Frangakis, who's just finished up there. And uh, he said they had, it was tremendously effective in there. And what is the Bible discovery process that, that they're talking about? Uh, it's based on this. You can take the word of God to others by offering to read the Bible with them. You and I, any of us, pretty well any of us, can do this, okay? It's, it's, it's as simple as, but it's a very powerful thing. And I just want to share really quickly a couple of things that I love about this, okay? It's asking God to give me a person, anyone, in my network, all right, that I can say to, are you interested in reading the Bible with me? And the way it works is like this. I really love it. I've done part of this but I haven't done it in the way that these guys do it, and it's really good. And what you do is you say, what we do is we read a passage each week, we come together, and we say, what is God saying to me? Okay, here's the first bit. It's not what's God saying to you. It's what is God saying to me in this. Okay? And then here's the real clincher, okay? Okay? Here's a really good one, which I have missed for most of my life in, in adding in, which is this. Now that we know what God is saying, to, that, that I know what God is saying to me, what am I going to do about it? Okay? What am I going to do about it? And then we go away. Pray for each other or, you know, whatever. Go away, come back next week and say, okay, where are we at? What happened? And so here's the thing that I love about it. Number one, it's not a teaching thing, okay? It's a mutual journey together. And it's not saying what's God got to say to you, and uh, I, I love being a teacher, you know? Like I just, I, I'll tell you what God's going to say to you. God's got a wonderful plan for your life, and I'm going to tell you what it is, yeah? Um, I love doing that, right? But actually, it's not, no, 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 Jello, you don't do that. You just concentrate on you, on what is God saying to me, and what am I going to do about it? But I do it in the presence of another person who pro, pro, you know, may not be a believer. What does that do? That's called discipling. It's called having somebody watch me and walk with me as we listen to God and do what he tells us. 
it's a little bit different to saying, I'm going to teach you all this stuff. And I'm going to give you all this information. Okay? And sometimes I might struggle and they'll see me struggle. And sometimes I might, you know, get it right and I see that, right? And it's an encouraging and it's really good. Now, here's the other thing that happens with that is that in the process that these guys are doing, and Crossways has done, a, 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 they've been at it for about 15 years, is the thing is this, when you talk with someone, you know, with that, that person, and they're doing it, and after a couple of weeks you say, have you found this helpful? Yep. Okay, if you have, is there someone else in your life that you think would benefit from this? Now, here's the other really interesting thing. If they say yes, which apparently they do, even before the question's asked, you say, well, you go and do it with them. You see, you see what's, what's happening here? And not necessarily saying, let's get them all in here. It's like, okay, you do it with them. There's a multiplying process that happens. Now, that's just really skimming over the, you know, the, the thing. Is, if you're interested, have a look at that. But the way that it's done is this. You pray and you ask for somebody that the Lord will give you that may be open to that. Now, here's the thing that I learned, which I never knew before, and I'd never crossed my mind. It was just t- when I was sitting and, and they talked about it down at the, uh, when, uh, I've forgotten this guy's name. He's the senior pastor at Crossways. Dale Stevenson, Dale Stevenson thank you. When, when Dale was talking, he said, this is how we can recognize who may be a potential person. I thought, oh, this will be interesting. You know, I'll, that, that would be very helpful. He said, it's somebody you've got a relationship with. Okay, that's fine. But it's somebody who has done something for you. I thought, I I had to, he he said it a few times. He said, so it's someone you've got a relationship with, but someone who's done something. It may be a neighbor who's mowed your lawn for you or, you know, done you a favor, so to speak. I thought, wow, that's amazing. I, I had never thought of that, but that's one of the indicators that this may be a person that's, you know, uh, that's worth asking, that may be open to it. What does that mean, He's done, they've done something for you? When I thought about it, I thought, well, they're favourable towards you. In other words, they're willing, they may be willing to hear. So what you do is, you just ask them, you say, would you be interested in reading the Bible with me? I'm looking for someone to read the Bible with. Would you be interested? What are they going to say? Yes or no? Simplex. Okay, let them say no. All right. And if they say no, that's all right, that's fine. If they say yes, off we go with that. And there's people that have been coming into relationship with Christ through that. Why? Because they are interacting with Jesus. With Jesus in the scriptures. They're not, they're, we're not talking doctrine. We're not talking denominations. We're not talking anything except you and Jesus. So that's a, a very practical way you can do that. And Alpha, which I think you were saying you guys were going to do, Alpha is, is a good lead on, you know, towards that, something that runs parallel in there. But I want to encourage you in that. Um, we're looking at Hellenic ministries, and their vision is to transform the nation of Greece into a people who seek God's heart and serve him wholeheartedly. And like Faith mentioned, uh, this year, they will be doing, I think it's 15 years, they've been giving out the, the, the New Testaments, and they're, they're way, out, way over one and a half million total that they've given out to people. And it's been an amazing thing, tremendous vision, because you and I, you and I probably find it very, very hard to comprehend what it's like not being able to have a Bible to read or having it in our thinking that we, I'll go and read the Bible. That is not how it works in a place like Greece with the Greek Orthodox Church. You don't read the Bible because you might get it wrong. Okay? Now, I know that sounds harsh. It's actually, in, when you look at the situation, it's understandable why that's all come up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But nonetheless, that's the, the end result uh, of that. But here's people who have been given for the first time a New Testament in their language that they know it's okay to read. The Greek Orthodox Church has said it's all right to read that. And God is touching people's lives through that. Not in tens of thousands, but in significant numbers you know, from that. So the next step for Hellenic Ministries is how do we move into the next phase? 
And at the moment, they're in the critical point, which is, do we continue with the Western model of, you know, church planting as in trying to get churches, you know, set up, you know, uh, kind of thing? Or is there another way forward for us? Now, in my thinking, people have been given one and a half million Bibles. It'd be great to be able to get them to read those Bibles, you know, in a consistent way where they can meet Jesus in there. So that's one way ahead for them. But I love their vision. So if we remove it from Hellenic ministry, it's just theirs. What about if our vision was to transform the nation of Australia, the world, Maryborough, yeah, into a people who seeks God's heart and to serve him wholeheartedly? Wouldn't that be fantastic to do that? How are we going to do that? Let me tell you, programs like Alpha, which is a really good one, okay, that's a really good one. It's, it's probably one of the better programs we've had, you know, over the last 50 years or so. That's not telling you how old I am, it's how old Tim is, he knows. Um, but there's, there's lots of other programs, you know, and when push comes to shove, folks, it's not the program that's going to do it. It's not the program that's going to do it. And can I just say to you, and I'm happy to have a discussion about this, it's not the Holy Spirit that's going to do it in the way that a lot of people think. I, I'm just going to somehow sit there and God's going to do something. 99.9% .9 of the time that God has done great things in the world, guess how he's done them? Through his people. Through people like you and me that say, hey, I can't do everything, but I'm going to do what I can do. I can't reach everyone, but you're going to reach those around me. I'm open to do that. I'm open to take a step. Lord, I'm available to you. you know? And God can and will use you. It is the Holy Spirit that works through that. Okay? But ask yourself this question. Could God convert the whole world? Yes, he could. He could do it just like that. You know? Really, the bottom line is, there is a sense in which he doesn't need you and me, does he? So why does he persist? There must be a reason. There must be a reason. And the reason isn't because he is dependent on you and me. The reason is, I believe, because... In working through us, we get to know him better. My dad was a mechanic. And uh, I remember there were times I busted my cars. <laughs> and my dad you know, would fix them. I'd go, Dad, I, I've blown the motor on my car. Okay, we will fix it. <laughs> okay, oh, all right, yeah. Oh, all right. So I would sit there with him and I'd work with him. And you know what? I learned so much, not about mechanicking. I did learn about mechanicking. But you know what I learned about? I learned about my dad. I learned about my dad. I learned about what he valued. I learned about what sort of a person he was, about his, his personhood. And God wants to work with you and me so that we can see him more clearly. So that we can be, as it says, transformed. We can have Christ formed in us. So we find that as we let God work in us and through us, we start to think a, bit, a little bit more like God. You know, have you ever had the experience where you go, there's somebody that maybe I don't get along with, you know, naturally. And then one day I find actually... I'm somehow feeling more open to that person. And I go, that's God. That's Jesus in me. And then as soon as I hear, I go, oh, I get it. I get what you're talking about. And in my life, I'm starting to see just this much an understanding of why Jesus would go to the cross. Just, just this much. And so we get to know God better as we're involved with him.
having a good conscience. Uh, what happened there? <gasps> oh, who put these slides together? Oh. Anyway, that's the second half of that verse, uh, which says, you know, to, to put, make Christ Lord of your heart in 15, and then to be ready to answer the, the, the questions people have. And verse 16 goes on and says this, having a good conscience, which means I'm right in my heart with God, okay? That while you are spoken against by, as evildoers, which happens, you know, Christians generally in society today, in a lot of people's minds, are now the bad guys, okay? How are we going to fix that? <laughs> You're not going to fix it by having a political argument, I'm telling you. You're not going to fix it by having campaigns and, and, you know, having great arguments. You know how we're going to fix it? We're going to fix it by walking with Jesus and living Jesus into our society around us. So while you have spoken against this evil this, they may be disappointed in a good way those who curse your good way of life in Christ. Okay? In other words, they will be shown in their heart and minds that they uh, haven't got the right idea. G.K. Chesterton said this. He said, at least five times the faith has appeared, has to all appearances gone to the dogs. And he's talking about things like the uh, Renaissance, things like the Enlightenment, thing, you know, di different times in history, the five major times when society around have gone, that's it, they're gone, the church is gone, yeah? Gone to the dogs. And he says, in each of these five cases, it was a dog that died. I don't say that to us for us to be kind of triumphalist or big-headed or whatever. What I'm saying to you is this. The church of God will never die, will never go away. That is never the question. The question is always, will I be on board? Will I be on board? Am I living in a way that, it's going to help me to survive into the world that's coming up. Am I living in a way that gives a model to my kids and my grandkids to help them survive in the world that's coming up, which is very, very challenging. All that matters is Jesus. Everything else is tactics. Do you know that is really, really easy to say in theory, but it's actually the truth. Let me put it another way to you. Five seconds. Angelo's five second rule for gauging everything. You know what the five seconds are about? Five seconds after I've died, what's going to be important? The answer to that question should color the whole of our lives. And here's the second part of that, and I'll close on this. Five seconds after my neighbour has died, what's going to be the most important thing? That really needs to colour my attitude towards my neighbour. Easier said than done, but with Jesus, doable. Second half of that that I want to share with you, leave with you is this, this, this little verse. It says, Lord Jesus, let us give them the best we have. That's all those people around us. Let our life be an inspiration. You know what? The, the, the Greek word for inspiration, Reese, okay? That's it. And theos, it's, it's, a, it's a God breathing. In other words, let, let our lives show something of God. Show something of God. Be inspired. And let our memory be a benediction. How's your Latin? <laughs> no, not, real good. not real good. Okay. So I'll tell you. Benediction. Bene dicte. Good words. In other words, may people, after we have gone, have reason to give thanks for our lives. Isn't that a good thing? It can be done and it can happen. Your life in Christ is, is enthroned in your life. 
can be inspiring for other people. Your life lived for Christ can be a cause of giving thanks to God. Let's pray. Father, I've gone on a bit, but nonetheless, I ask that your spirit would take that which is helpful and just really embed it in our hearts. And Lord, help me, help us to keep growing in you, to keep on intentionally, deliberately letting you work on us, work in us, and Lord, work through us. And Lord, may this church continue and even more be a blessing into this part of the world where they are. And we pray that for all the other churches in the area too, Lord. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. Continue to do it, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Because I, I think the Lord has some significant messages to hammer home through Angelo's good word this morning. I'd like to base our communion today out of, out of John 20. It's an event that happened kind of immediately at the resurrection of Jesus when the boys were hanging around together. Thomas had stepped out. The, the, the kind of atmosphere had got too tight for him. He'd stepped out. And while he was out, Jesus steps in. And so then ultimately Thomas comes back. Jesus is gone. The boys are going off their nuts saying, well, you should have been here, Thomas. You just missed it all. And he says, until I see it with well, my own two eyes, I am not going to believe it. And the story goes on to say a week later, you see, it wasn't just until I see it with my own two eyes, but until I put my hand in his hands, in his side, until I actually do that. Now, according to Thomas, Jesus wasn't in the room, but have a listen to this. A week later, so that is a week after the resurrection. Here we go, a week later, which is why I focused on this morning. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out, put your hand, put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. And so here we are now, seven days after we were singing Alleluia and Christ is risen. But in this communion service, I invite us to struggle alongside Doubting Thomas. Today we're invited, to, similarly to Thomas, as Thomas, to say that very deep thing each of us feel. That unless I see him for myself, I won't believe. We're invited to feel wary, uncertain, skeptical, and perhaps even envious of those whose faith seems to be a lot more secure and stronger than our own. Now, there's a great deal that's incredibly intriguing around this encounter between Thomas and Jesus. But I think, for me, one of the most intriguing things is that Jesus appeared to his skeptical disciple in a body that's scarred, wounded, and traumatized. A body that openly bears its traumatic history. A body that refuses to hide its suffering, its sorrow, its brokenness. What Jesus carries is not just old scars. They're wounds that are so raw that the doubting disciple puts his finger in them. Where this links in, I think, with Jello's sermon is that Jesus' wounds signal engagement in as much as Thomas's response, reaching out to touch them, does as well. Real presence 
real pain. It speaks the very words that each of us hunger to hear. I am with you. I am with you where it hurts. Even after death, I dwell in the searing heat of uncertainty where you dwell. See, Jesus' wounded and resurrected body reminds us that some hurts are for keeps. Some of the markers of pain, loss, trauma and horror leave traces that no amount of prayer or piety will take away. Some wounds remain even after resurrection and that's okay. It's okay to celebrate Jesus, his rising, and to grieve our catastrophic losses at the same time. It's okay to hear other people's uplifting faith stories and say, you know something, I'm really happy for you, but my heart is still broken. It's okay to ache and to hold that ache in tension with the joy of the resurrection of Jesus at Easter. And, you know, for some of us, if we're struggling with the, the joy of Easter, if we're finding it difficult to access right now, rest in the fact that Jesus never sheds the marks of his pain, not even when he bursts from the tomb. Consider the wonderful truth that ours is a faith of paradoxes, you see, we Christians, we live by dying. Remember, I am crucified with Christ, full stop. We live by dying. We receive by giving. We rule by serving. And our job is not to collapse those paradoxes, but to honour the complexities and having the courage to say, I don't know how this works honour their complexities and live fruitfully and faithfully in the light of the resurrection of Jesus despite those challenges. You see, we need to be reminded this morning that Jesus' resurrected body, his victorious body, it still retains the scars. Scriptures tell us we will know him who was pierced and we will know him who was pierced because of his scars. And what strikes me about Thomas's story is not that he doubts, but that he does so, so openly. Without shame, without guilt. I mean, how different the church would be if we embraced doubters similarly, as generously as Jesus did, and as generously as the other disciples embraced Thomas. Wounds and doubts, we all have them. Doubts and wounds. Welcome to life the week after Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> Welcome to life in the shadow of an empty tomb. This is the witness that we bring to people. Despite us still journeying in our wounds and doubts. We're prepared to trust the future that we know that may not be known to a God that we do. And if this sounds a bit anticlimactic, then consider this, that when Thomas's doubts meet Jesus' wounds, new life erupts. Faith blossoms and the doubting disciple becomes a carrier of good news. Resurrection all over again. And it's verse 3 of when I survey the song that we sung on Good Friday. Verse 3, I see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns comprise so rich a crown. And so this table, it speaks richly of the wounds a place where our doubts and wounds can meet. 
Because Jesus honours Thomas, his desire to see more, to experience more, to encounter more. Even when Thomas doesn't have it all together. You can come to this table not having it all together. It's here for us. He blesses those who struggle to believe, but who stick around anyway. He leans towards those who yearn for more. And Jesus leads with brokenness so that we can follow him confidently into this new life and glory. So during this week, during our hard times, may we find solace and hope and courage in the wounded and resurrected Christ. These cups, one with bread, one with juice, they speak to us. His body broken, his body broken, his blood shed to bring us life and hope. Jesus does not mask his wounds, but carries them. Would you reach out and touch them this morning as you engage his body that was broken? and his blood that was shed. This morning we have a tradition here that we, as the service come to distribute the, the cups with the, the bread and the juice. Take the bread, recognise his body broken for you. Hold on to your cup so that we can drink together and we welcome you. Can I have the service to come please this morning? And we'll pray as we distribute them. Thank you. Father, we're so grateful for your mercy and your grace. That on the cross, sorrow and love flow mingled down. See his hands, his side, his feet. And that in your resurrected body, you don't hide the wounds, the scars. And yet they speak to us of engagement. Give us courage this morning, Lord. Give us courage to step in to this mystery, resurrected life, as we remember what you did to make it possible for us to do that, that in your body you carried and removed what was wrong. And in your blood you washed us clean to restore what is right. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Let's drink together, symbolic of the oneness that we share in him. Father, we're grateful for your mercy and your grace to us to bring us together as your people. And I guess, yeah, it's... As we get about our lives, it's not so much the knowledge, the things that we say to people that, that they will remember, but they will remember the benediction of our lives, the good word of our lives that says this is how we made people feel. As, as you work your works in us to bring transformation to us, that we bring that to those around us. So we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
gather you to pray. But Joe and Faith, thanks for joining us this morning. We trust it's been a blessing to you as well. Because all of our hope is in Him. It's hope is now hope in Him. All our hope. Jesus Messiah